when I, I had just come to Christ, even though I'd grown up in church, I, did, I knew God here, not here. At age 16, I gave my life to the Lord, and either when I was 16 or 17, I remember the lady who had just been led to the Lord three or four months earlier ahead of me, uh, she picked up a book by Oral Roberts called Seed Faith. Remember that? Those, anybody here besides me? I got a, hand, a couple handfuls. And it was about learning how to honor God with your finances. Now I'm a 17-year-old kid. Uh, I was making about $40, $50 a week at, at a, working at a grocery store at that time in a bakery. And I remember she told us about how God was challenging she and her husband to, to honor God with their finances, and God told them to give their finances. And the Lord, we either pay our rent, our, our, our house payment, or we begin to honor you. And she says, and she felt God spoke to her to go ahead and believe God for a miracle. So they, they paid their, their, what they would say their tithe. And when it came time for, for uh, she was telling this to our class, our little bunch of kids that had just gotten saved. And uh, she was saying, guys, would you pray with me that God would provide? Because this is the first time we've ever really stepped out in faith. We're brand new in Jesus. But yet, uh, so... We all, it, guys, I grew up Catholic, so when you ask a Catholic to pray, what do you do? You all get down on your knees. So we're down on our knees praying, about 30 or 40 of us in this room. Almost all of them had just been recently come to Christ. And there was a knock at the door, and there was a lady walked up and says, Ma'am, is, is there a, so Kathleen gets up, Kathleen Tabor gets up and goes and says, uh, Are you, is there a Kathleen here. And she says, ma'am, I'm Kathleen. She said, well, God told me. I live about 10 miles from here. I was in my armchair hat, spending time with God. God told me to come to this church, to this room, and here's an envelope. So Kathleen, she walked away, shut the door, and she goes, wow, that's weird. And so she opens the door, and inside is a check. Do you know what the check was for? To the penny, her house payment. Let me ask you, can God speak? All of us brand new converts, they had never ever met in their entire life. And so my first time of seeing God speak, God confirmed right then. So about a, shortly after that, I was praying and God says, Randy, I want to, I, I saw, I was driving from school and I saw a, one of the girls in my youth group was walking down the sidewalk and God told me, turn around and go give her $20. Now, guys, I made $50 before taxes. Back when minimum wage was 205. I looked it up today. God, you want me to give everything pretty well that I had? And Lord, you know I have some things that I need to pay for. So I turned around, one of those little promptings, I turn around and I says, hey, God told me I'm supposed to give you $20. Guess what she was praying for? She had a specific need and she started crying. Now, I'm working in a grocery store washing dishes in a bakery. And I don't know if it was a month later or whenever it was, but I remember I was back there literally over hot steam coming up this big apron. And, and I'm just sitting there. I said, God, you know I have a need. God, I, I need $20, God, you know. And then all of a sudden, there was a tap on my shoulder. And the girl from the front counter walked back to me and says, Hey, Randy, there's a pretty little girl up in the front of the bakery who would like to talk to you. And I'm going, Oh, <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> so this, this girl, actually, she came back to where I was uh, in the bakery. And she says, Randy, I don't know why, but I was, God just told me I'm supposed to come to the grocery store and I'm supposed to give you $20. So I, I began to see that if I'll begin to put God first in my life, and that God would speak to me about specific things, then God would take care of my needs. Does that make sense? This is at age 16 or 17, just brand new in Jesus by just a handful of months, maybe less than a year. And I, I begin to see God speak to me on a regular basis. And so tonight I want to just talk to you about, does God want to speak to his children? 
Does God want to speak to his children all the time, every day, about everything? So, we see it in the Bible, but many people have been taught that God doesn't do that. How many of you know Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore? And I'm going to tell you, I'd, I'd love to just have hours where I could just tell you story after story after story of God's supernatural. God said, I obeyed, and he did miracles. We'll try and weave in some, but we need to finish the sermon. Literally, I could, I, I'm, I'm at the place where I've been walking with Jesus 46 years. I, I counted it on the calendar this year or today when I was figuring out my minimum wage for my sermon. Guys, I've, been, I, I've come to know Christ. I've been walking with God 46 years. And even when things haven't happened like I thought, thought they should have happened, I have seen God faithful and faithful and literally have thousands of stories where someone, there's not anybody on this planet could convince me that there's not a God. Because God is a supernatural God that moves in power and wants to speak to his people if they'll learn how to hear his voice. So my challenge for you tonight is that you would pay attention enough because God wants to cultivate in you your ability to hear his will for your life. And God wants to confirm it. In fact, you may not think it, but God wants to speak to you where you hear more than you could ever imagine, more than you would ever want to hear from God. God wants you to know him. Not just, God, give me when I have a need. God says, I want to use you. I want to have a deeper relationship with you. I have more for your life. Can we get an amen on that? All right. So the importance of cultivating a personal, dynamic relationship with the Lord Jesus is something that God desires. I'd say it for a, for a believer in Christ, it should be a must. And God wants to step into your life. And here we have a, a concept here at Grace is go fill the city with Jesus. Guys, if you want to fill the city with Jesus, learn to cultivate a consistent relationship with God. I'm going to challenge you to read your Bible five out of seven. Why do I say five out of seven? What if one day you don't read your Bible? Does God still love you? Will God even speak to you if you didn't read your Bible that day? But I'm going to challenge you to spend time every day. I choose the morning. But five out of seven. And, and what I want you to do is I want you to get a Bible and a journal and, or your computer and your you're, you cut, nowadays what I do is I cut and paste. Read my Bible on my computer and cut and paste. So what I say, tell people to do is I want you to read, not just for information. When you're brand new in Jesus, you want to read because it's new. But I want to go beyond just reading for information and what is the Bible telling you, which is important. I want you to read for what is God saying to you. And that you would change from just gaining information to learning to cultivate an attitude of hearing what the Spirit of God is saying where he speaks to you. Like, you know what's the best marital counseling that you could ever do? Is read your Bible five out of seven. Every day when you're reading your Bible, it's not just reading your Bible, but learning how to hear what God says. Read your Bible five out of seven. And every day say, God, I'm asking you to teach me how to hear your voice. I'm asking that you would speak to me. And then take the one or two or three things that kind of jump off the page that kind of land in your heart. Does that make sense? You guys know what I'm talking about? If you don't, ask God. He'll start doing it. Ask God to start jumping off the page, and then when you take it and write it in your journal, underline it in your Bible. And if you don't underline in your Bible, don't do that. Underline. Some people are worried about having, you, you want to you see God use you, underline your Bible in 20 years now, you're under, the verse you underline, you'll just open to it, and God goes, ping, use that. But Okay, five out of seven, read your Bible, put it in a journal. At the end of the week, go back and say, what was it that God was saying? In marital counseling, I always say, don't, they can't even talk. I don't know if I love you. I don't know if I've ever loved you. How many times have I heard that? Okay. There's a little knob on the toilet. Okay. So ask her, you, you seek God for you, what God's saying to you, not what's for your husband. You seek God for what God's saying to you, not for your wife. They'll come back. And almost inevitably, she's read five out of seven, maybe seven out of seven. He's read two out of seven, but we're going to work on that, right? Don't do that either. Start reading your Bible. Okay? I, guys, that's how I've seen hundreds, tons of marriages put back together. Okay? <clears throat> so uh, put, put, their, put their life, so they'll, she'll come in and she'll say, this is what God said to me. And he'll almost always go, that's what I've been trying to tell you. Guess what with him? 
she'll go, that is what I've been trying to tell. How many of you know the Holy Spirit knows? But if we have our spouse trying to tell us, it's like, who are they? How many of you, when God says there's a problem, then there's a possibility of change. There's a possibility of repentance. There's a possibility of asking for forgiveness. Okay? So five out of seven, God provided for me. Now, God speaks. Each one of you is different. And how God speaks to you is not like he speaks to me. But, he is, but there are a lot of things that are just biblical principles that we can apply. But each one of you need to learn how to cultivate the habit of hearing God's voice and saying, is this from God or is this my flesh or is this from Satan? If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. God wants to teach you to know his voice. And again, does Satan talk? Now, most any unbeliever... As well as believers, have you ever been tempted and had thoughts that came into your mind out of the pit of hell? And they'll go, yes, I have. Now, has God ever spoke? Now, God doesn't speak anymore. He, that was something in the New Testament. Really? Well, Satan does, but God doesn't. No, I'm going to tell you, if you'll practice the habit of cultivating a relationship and asking God to start speaking to you, he will all the time. Every day. Everybody say every day. Every day. Okay? Now, Job 33, 14, God does speak sometimes one way and sometimes another, even though people may not understand it. I believe that God is speaking all the time, but many of us have never cultivated the habit of learning how to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Now, again, I knew God here in my mind. I loved God. I, would, I was, felt guilty when I sinned, but it wasn't until I saw people that were truly born again, and they shared with me the gospel, God went from my head to my heart. Guys, before when I would go to church and read the Bible, which I never did, it was like, gag me, who would ever read this book? When Christ went from my head to my heart, it was like those words in that book that I couldn't even stand now became life to me. They, be, they, would, they would, it's like, how, how did that, end up in that book. How did, how did God know? How many of you, that was my journey. God began to just become so real, and he would jump off the pages. Again, we didn't, I wasn't, I, I, the people led me to the Lord, they were three months old in Jesus. They didn't know what they were doing. We, we had grown up in, in re religious church. It doesn't matter what church you grew up. You could be, a, I, I grew up Catholic, but it doesn't matter. You could be a Methodist in a Methodist church. You could be at Grace Church, and you could know God here and miss him here. All right? So when God became real to me, God says this, John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep, I know them. My sheep, they follow me. In other words, one of the evidences that you are born again is that you hear God's voice. Possibly, if you not hear God's voice, is because maybe you know him here, not here. We'll solve that problem at the end of the service. God says, I want you to know me. I want you to know my voice. And I mean, I want you to follow me. That means you're choosing God's will for your life, not your will. You know, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. And when he was teaching them how to pray, it says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Do you guys remember that little prayer there in Matthew, right? God wants to teach us, but what, what it is is a surrender. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's starting a, light, a worship relationship with God. Then it says, Lord, not my will, but your will. In other words, God, you speak to me. Does, at that moment, does God want you to know his will? How are you going to know his will if he doesn't speak to you? So God wants to teach you how to pray, and how you learn how to pray is learn how to have God speak to you so that you can line your life and his life into one path. And God says, you, you seek me. You put me first. I'll provide for you. I'll rebuke the evil. I'll give you power to forgive those who've hurt you. Amen? All right. <clears throat> My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. Mark 4, 9. Then Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Again, I believe God's speaking all the time, but we aren't always paying attention or we don't want to hear what God has to say for us. 
We just want to feel good about ourselves. We want Jesus, we want Jesus for fire insurance so we don't go to hell. But we're not always willing to say, God, what do you have for me to do today to fulfill your purpose, your destiny over my life? Oswald Chambers, great man of God, this is what he said. He says, the voice of the Spirit of God is as gentle as a summer breeze, so gentle that unless you are living in complete oneness and fellowship with God, you'll never hear it. And I believe this is where a lot of Christians are. They may truly be born again. If they die, they're going to go to heaven. But to a high degree, they don't know how to hear God's voice. And God says that needs to stop because you can't do my will if you don't know my voice and my sheep know my voice. Experiencing God, Henry Blackaby, who's done a great faith. God has used him even among churches that don't believe God speaks. You know, 40 years ago, you talk to most Baptists. Anybody here ex-Baptist or Baptist still and one foot in, one foot out, doesn't matter. And when, we, when, when we get to heaven, God doesn't really care. He says, did you follow me? But for a lot of churches, they were raised where God used to do miracles. That was something that did in the New Testament. Well, does God still speak? Does God still answer prayer? Can God speak? Guys, it doesn't, G, G, the, the Bible nowhere says that he stopped doing miracles. Not one place. Not one place. Now, they can use a partial scripture that says, and you're going to build your whole life and throw out 90, 95% of the Bible off of one verse. Mis, misuse. If you'd like, I'd love to enter a conversation with you. I'll just tell you thousands of stories where God spoke. Amen? I, I need to roll on because I want to tell you some of those stories. So what Henry Blackaby did is knowing God comes from an intimate love relationship with God. Not a guilt-driven, not a shame-driven, but a love-intimate relationship. One of Henry Blackaby's key things, he says, that has transformed many of his Baptist friends is, first of all, that God, number one is that God speaks today through his word, through his spirit within you. And the key to the Christian life is not asking God to bless what you're doing or bless the mess that you're in because you're doing your will. Ask God, say, God, what are you doing on this earth and how can I join you? How can I partner with what the Holy Spirit is doing in my city, my family, my neighborhood, wherever you are? That's what God is interested in. So how does God speak to us? I'm going to talk about two words. The words logos and the word rhema. Logos, that is God's written word. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word logos. And the word logos was with God. So the Logos was with God, and the Word was God. This is about the Trinity. So Jesus is the Word. And the cool thing is, is God has given us the Bible. The Bible is God's written Word to man. The number one way that God's going to speak, you, speak to you as either you're reading the Bible or you're hearing God's Word spoken from Scriptures. That's the number one way. Logos, the written Word. The second way is when a person has gone from knowing God here to allowing Jesus Christ to become his personal Savior, the Holy Spirit is living and dwelling in him, it says the Holy Spirit has come, Emmanuel, God with us, God within us. God lives and dwells in you. It's John 3, 16, you're born again, where God's gone from your head to your heart. It says the Holy Spirit lives and dwells within us. And then God speaks to us, not just in our mind, but in our spirit man. But many times when God's speaking to us in our spirit man, it's an impression, it's a whisper, whatever it is, it'll come in our thoughts, but there'll be a bearing witness in our inner man. Do you, are we tracking with me, anybody here? If you've ever listened to a sermon and you go, how in the world did that guy know what I and my wife had just talked about? He couldn't have known the discussion in the car, and he walked in and spoke exactly. Has anybody ever had that experience? That is the Holy Spirit inside of you speaking the Logos, which now becomes Rhema, when it goes from a spoken word to God himself speaking to you about your situation. Rhema, consequently, 10, Romans 10, 17. Consequently, faith, Rhema, comes from hearing the message, hearing God's word, and the word, the message is heard through the words of Christ. In other words, and we're going to talk about this. All right. <clears throat> Logos is the written word of God for everybody. Mainly, 
the way God speaks to us is through his written word. Rhema is the word of God. He speaks to you personally for a specific word, for a specific promise, for a specific person, for a specific time period, and for that time only. Now, it doesn't mean that that promise can't last longer, depending on what God says. Let me give you an example. How many of us know the story of Peter and the guys out fishing? They've been fishing, and not the story I shared. They've been out fishing, but now a storm arises, and they're afraid of losing their life. Then all of a sudden, they see this, what they think is a ghost, walking on the water. And who is it, guys? Some of you Bible. Who is it? It's Jesus. And, and Peter, kind of new in his faith, not always believing. He's that impetuous guy that I think all of us can relate to. He says, Jesus, is that you? And Jesus goes, yes, it is, Peter. Peter goes, Jesus, if it's you, speak the word, and I will come to you. Now, that's a man that is saying, I'm testing this thing called God out. And God speaks rhema, a word to Peter, not to the other disciples. The other disciples would have heard that, and they tried, guess it wouldn't have worked. But God spoke to Peter, says, Peter, come out. So Peter gets out of the boat. Can you imagine that first step of storm? They're worried about dying, and Jesus calls Peter. And he starts walking on the water. But when he gets his eyes off of God, he begins to sink. See, rhema is a word from Jesus that is spoken to you for that time. Now, if, if Peter tomorrow or the next day or the next week says, man, I walked on water last week. It must be good for now. Guess what would have not worked? That was a rhema was a word for that day, for that hour, for that situation. Where many a Christian has made a mis grave mistake is they've taken a scripture and they said, Lord, this is what you want to do. And they didn't say, God, is this what you want to do in and through me? See, faith comes when you take sometimes God's logos and you say, God, am I supposed to do this? Am I believing for this miracle, for this situation, for this sickness, for this provision, whatever it is? And the words that God speaks to your rhema, those things that jump off the page, highlighted during the week, you go, oh, my God. How many of you have, have you read, you're going, oh, God, I need you to do this. I pray, God, show me. You open up the Bible, and it was like, how could that have happened that that verse was right there? When I read it, it was in the daily reading plan, or I hate this, you open up the Bible, you flip-flopped, because that isn't always a good idea. Go jump off a cliff. You know, the pigs went over the cliff. Don't do that. But I'll be honest, in my early days, God, God showed me and, I, and did miracles. How many of you know God will even use our, our young Peter impetuousness? But over time, let's cultivate the habit of learning how to hear God with confidence. By the way, I have a used car salesman, so please, this is not what I meant. God is not a, a corrupt used car salesman that says, you've got to do this now or this deal is going to pass. Now, there's times when God will tell you, do it now. But if you've cultivated the habit, you're going to go, this is God, that's not God. Because Satan speaks too. All right, so my goal for you this week, I'm going to challenge you. Read your Bible five out of seven. Write down in your journal what is God saying and then look at it. So I want you to pray about these things. What is God saying to me about my job, me going in and filling my city with Jesus? What does God want to say about my family, about my spouse, about my children, or my lack of them and I need one? All right? Your friendships, who you hang out with, who God wants you to hang out with. Maybe your neighborhood, maybe your neighbors. How about this? Does God want you to fulfill the call and destiny he has on your life? I don't care what career you're in. You're all called into the ministry. Pay attention. If you don't know, go listen to last week. What does God want to do in your job? What does he want to do in your future? What does he want to do in your family? So how does God talk to us? Back to the Logos. God's the number one way that God speaks to us is through the Bible. This is the number one way. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, God's word, is inspired by God. And it is profitable for teaching, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God or the woman of God 
may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So the number one way that God will speak to us, train us, show us, guide us, correct us, is through his word, the spirit of God jumping off of the page into our spirit, okay? The Bible. The second way God speaks to us is through gifted teachers or preaches, preachers. Ephesians 4.11, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers, to appear God's work people for works of service or for ministry so that the body of Christ may be built up. So one of the ways that God will speak to us, just like you're here today, you're going to hear, hopefully in this sermon, because I prayed a whole lot for you guys, that God would speak to you. And I believe that God's going to answer my prayer because I've seen him do it in the past. All right? That God would speak to you so that you know that you know that you know that this is God's will. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, when we preach to you, Paul speaking here, says when we preach to you, you didn't think the words as just being from our own, our own, but you accepted it as the very word of God, which of course it was, and what happened? It changed your life. God will speak through other people, people in your small group, people who are speaking the word of God, all right? Number three, God speaks through impressions. What's an impression? That means when, when you, God's gone from your head to your heart, the Holy Spirit lives and dwells within you, and God wants to speak to you, his child. You know one of the things he wants to tell you every day? I love you. You're my favorite child. How many of you can say, I am God's favorite child? How many of you know you are God's favorite child? Now, guys, we believe that God speaks in his word. He wrote a love letter to you called the Logos, his written word. But he not just wants you to hear it in a letter, he wants you to get it right here where you know that you know I am God's favorite co kid. Amen? So, John, <clears throat> God speaks through impressions. John 14, 26, it says, the Holy Spirit will be your teacher and will bring to your mind all that, he, that I have said to you. 1 Corinthians 14, God is not the author of confusion. Who is the author of confusion? A corrupt Car salesman named Satan. I mean, you know, Satan's always going to ask you to do something you know you shouldn't do. He's always going to question the truth of God's word. He's going to put doubt and unbelief in your mind. But God is not the author of confusion. He's the God, author of peace. Colossians 3.15, it says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. How many times, again, I hate saying how many times, one of the ways that you know that God's spoken to you or when you're praying about something is because the Holy Spirit lives in you. He's the comforter. He's the guide. He'll bring things in remembrance. As you're hearing something, there's just this sense of peace and confirmation that that was God. Are we tracking with me? Maybe. But if you're brand new to this thing, it's okay. I hear it, but I don't know. When you're praying about something, you're asking God to speak to you. He will over and over and over tell you what's his heart. It's like this. I have a brand new grandbaby. I, I was watching my grandchildren while they're at the hospital. When I'm a two-year-old, God will speak to you like a two-year-old. But if you're 22 years old, how many of you know you better be better paying attention more than you were when you were a two-year-old? But I've got some 20-year-olds who don't pay attention as much as a two-year-old. And God said that needs to stop. You need to know my voice. Some of you have known God all your life, but you've not cultivated the habit of spending time with me to such a degree that you know me and you do what I tell you to do. Again, <clears throat> I'm going to read John Romans 10, 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. God speaks to you through the word. You begin to build a reservoir. It's like putting logs ready for a fire, and when God speaks, then there's already wood, there's already kindling, there's, there's already gas on the fire. When God speaks, there's faith. How? One, because I've had God speak to me in the past, but I've also, God's beginning to confirm his word. I will t <clears throat> tell a story. Wow, we're running out of time. Oh, my gosh. I just got started. Have you guys love, don't you love it when I do that? No, you hate it, Randy. Stop doing it. I will tell you one story, and then we'll get on to the other points. I remember when I was 17 years, oh, no, I was 19. 
I was 19, maybe 20 years old. I joined the Army. I was coming home on leave. And so my brother-in-law, Randy Fender, and my little brother, Larry Pfeiffer, uh, said, let's go hunting. So we went bear hunting, and we went up in the mountains, didn't see anything. And on the way back, we're coming down this long mountain road, and I had a great big heavy-duty three-quarter ton Dodge Power Wagon four-wheel drive monster truck. It was just heavy, heavy, heavy duty. In fact, when I sold it, they used it for a wrecker, okay? Just kind of let you know. <clears throat> so I'm driving down the road, probably 55, 60 miles an hour, dirt road. You know, but it's a big, it wasn't just a dirt road. It was a dirt highway because it was major, major, well, like logging trucks. And I'm driving down, we're talking, we're laughing, and God speaks to me in my spirit, man, the impression, and God says, slow down, Randy. And I'm going, wow, it was, there was a firmness to us. There was a sense of urgency to it. So I turned to my brother-in-law. I had never done this before, ever. I turned to my brother-in-law and my little brother, and I said, guys, God told me to slow down. Now, they had seen some of the transformation in my life. So I slowed down to maybe 35, 40 miles an hour. I came into a curve. There was a, a, where the road where these big trucks had been driving, it had rutted out. My truck hit those ruts and started literally crow hopping like this. And it was kind of on a, on a curve like that. And I started crow hopping. So to, rather than going over the edge, I pulled it to the left. When I hit the, to, pulled it to the left, I hit some gravel. And I rolled, to, the whole truck flipped over and rolled down about a, rolled about a 12 foot embankment. And I'm, my first thought was, God, I did what you told me to do. Now, the cab was completely crushed. Uh, it was below the steering wheel. In fact, it kind of caught my head between the steering wheel, and I lost just a little bit here. Now, I think really it was a slow reaction over the years. It, <clears throat> it's just taken 40 years to recede. But, guys, that was it. That was the worst damage. All the windows had been broken out, so we climbed out. I asked, is everybody okay? We climbed out the back of the truck. And, I, and I'm going, and they're all going, Randy, I thought God told you to slow down. Now, back then they didn't have, you know, cell, cell phones, so some guy came by with his CB radio, and, and he called the state patrol. But what we did is we hooked a chain onto my truck, rolled it back over, got it on the road, got a big jack, and jacked up the hood and drove into town. <clears throat> Met the highway patrolman about halfway. Pulled in my mom's uh, had a little hotel there, and so I said, Mom, they, they, ran the ho they own and ran the hotel. I says, hey, I had a little accident. I bent my truck up a little bit. So she walked out, and she said, well, what part didn't you bent up? Kind of let you know how serious it was. I'm going, God, I, I did what you told me to do. I slowed down, and I was still in an accident. Why did, why did you? A couple years later, I was talking with my little brother, and he says, Randy, he says, you know when God became real to me? He says, the day that you told us, remember when we wrecked? I said, yes. He says, the day that you told me, God told you to slow down. Because we couldn't have known. Nobody would have known. He says, because if you not slowed down, if we'd have hit that curve, that same curve, at the, the, at the rate we were going, rather than going left, we'd have gone right. And we'd have gone off the edge of that mountain. And we'd have not stopped until... The, Every one of us was dead. And I knew that day that God was real because you heard what God said. How many of you know God wants to speak to you? He will warn you. He'll teach you. He'll guide you. Even spank you when you need it because he loves you. In other words, Randy, your, <clears throat> your time is up. There are two extremes that you need to avoid when thinking about impressions from God. One is the rationalist and the other is the mystic. The rationalist denies that God ever speaks to us through the mind. He says that God only speaks to, through the Bible and never through impressions. The mystic, on the other hand, is the one that every thought that comes to you that you get is from God. Both of these are wrong. God will speak to you through the word and God will speak to you through the inner man. And God will speak to you, uh, uh, just take a time, through dreams. Old Testament, New Testament, God speaks through dreams. It's not, I don't have God speak to, I've had a couple times. But again, I don't, I, I, my, just how God speaks to me, it's usually not through dreams. He'll give me 
pictures. He'll give me impressions. He'll speak specific words. All right? What God does is he tells us that we should always, when, God, when we're not sure about something, that we should test an impression. We should test if this is God. How many of you know God wants to show himself that he's not a corrupt used car salesman? And if it's God, he'll show, show with peace and confirmation. 1 John 4.1, it says, Don't always believe everything you hear just because someone says it's a message from God. Test it to see if it's really from him. And how many of you know if God will speak something to you? He says, like, I'm calling you to the mission field. You, so you leave everything and you go out of the mission field, but you've not prepared. Maybe after you've gone prepared, you've got it, your finances in order. Sometimes we can just get ahead of God, even something God speaks to us. So how many of you know God wants to guide you every day? Man, this is going to have to be point two next week. How to hear God's voice number two. How many of you know God wants to speak to you? Are you willing to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and teach you his voice? Are you, uh, are you willing to let God come in and make the necessary adjustments in your life that maybe there's some things in your life that are hindering what he's saying. Maybe because you're not believing what God says about you, you're believing what your past says about you. And God says, I want to change that. Because I am the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. I am the God that forgives, and my gifts and my call are over your life. I don't care what you say because I'm God and you're not. How I many you know God has a great plan for your life? You'll never know it unless you cultivate the habit of learning how to hear and listen God's word daily. And that not just hear it, but then go do it. And as you begin to step out in faith, you might be like Peter a little bit when God tells you to do something. But if you'll step out, even if you don't understand it, he will show himself in power. And then your life will be one story after another story after another story. And no one will ever be able to convince you that our God is not real. You know, I, well, I can tell you right now, there's not a person on this planet that could ever convince me that God's not real because I have thousands and thousands of stories. In fact, most of them I have forgotten. And to God be the glory. Amen.